Well, good morning to you, whether you're here at our central Vancouver campus or joining us at our battleground, East Vancouver, West Vancouver campus. Um, I'm glad you're here. My name is Corey. I'm one of the pastors on staff here, and I have the privilege today of jumping back into a series called Parables that we've been in periodically uh, throughout this year. And I, I don't want to be um, insulting to your intelligence and revisiting and reevaluating what, what is a parable, but I do feel the need to, just because we haven't been in it for a few months, let's do a little refresher. And I want you to know, when we're talking about parables, we are not talking about this, a pair of bulls, okay? <laughs> Likewise, when we're talking about parables, we are not talking about this, a pair of bulls, okay? Thank you for your sympathy laughs and my dad humor. I, I, that went over better at the Thursday service than it did here, so I'm a little disappointed in you 930 crop. But uh, anyways, when we refer to a parable, this is what we're referring to. Uh, it's a simple story that Jesus told to illustrate a greater spiritual lesson, and it really served two purposes. One, he wanted to compel a person... Uh, Oh, sorry, he wanted to draw attention to attention. And then secondly, he wanted to compel a personal response. That was the purpose of sharing uh, this, this illustration, this story. And what I think is important is we, before we head into our text today, uh, there's kind of levels of, of our text today and what Jesus is trying to unpack for his disciples. There's, there's being told what to do. That's good when we know what to do. Then a better instance is when we're told how to do something, right? It's not just what to do, but here's how you do it. And then the third and best option is when we're shown how to do it. So you with me? There's knowing what to do or being told what to do. Then there's being told how to do it, which is better. It's an upgrade. And then the best option is when you're shown how to do it. And I believe the text we're going to look at today does that. And I even just examples, I think through my life and how I had a dad who didn't just tell me what to do. Um, there were times when he would tell me how to do it, and then better yet, he would join me in the project or the venture I was doing and, and show me how to do it. Likewise, I'm just grateful that we have a God who um, likewise has, has modeled that for us in the person of Jesus Christ. By this, we know what love is, that Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. He didn't just tell us what to do. He didn't just tell us how to do it. He showed us how to do it. So we're going to be in Luke chapter 17. Uh, these parables, we've been going through the gospel of Luke, and we find ourselves in Luke chapter 17, and there's 10 verses. I, I want to note that while it's a series called Parables, the parable today is what we call a micro parable. It's really a, a short and sweet one. That doesn't mean the message is going to be short and sweet, so don't get too excited, okay? I know the hawks are playing, all right? Uh, We'll get you out here in a timely manner. But it's a micro parable. So it serves as kind of like a, an explanation point on the end of Jesus' teaching. So what I want to do is just simply read through this, the 10 verses, pause and pray together. Lord, help us see that it isn't just what to do, but how to do it. And you've shown us how to do it. Uh, and then walk through that together. So Luke chapter 17, if you've got a Bible, you can follow along, or it will be on the screen as well. This is what Jesus says to his disciples. Jesus said to his disciples, things that cause people to stumble are bound to come, but woe to anyone through whom they come. It would be better for them to be thrown into sea with a millstone tied around their neck than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. So watch yourselves. If your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. And if they repent, forgive them. Even if they sin against you seven times in a day and seven times come back to you saying, I repent, you must forgive them. The apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. He replied, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. Suppose, this is the parable here, suppose one of you has a servant plowing or looking after the sheep. Will he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along now and sit down to eat? Won't he rather say, prepare my supper, get yourself ready, and wait on me while I eat and drink? And after that, you may eat and drink. Will he thank the servant because he did what he is told to do? So you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. Let's pray together before we head into this. Father, I thank you for your word And I thank you that it is 
authoritative in our lives, that it's a foundation for us to build our lives on. And I thank you that it's living and active. It's not just good truths to live by, but it, they're, they're heart-changing, mind-changing, life-altering truths. And I pray that it would do that for us today, that it would penetrate hard hearts, um, that it would motivate still and idle feet and faith journeys, and God, that it would produce in us a righteousness that is desperately needed. So we pray for that kind of help today, that we wouldn't be just hearers of your word, but doers of it. And we ask these things in your son's name. Amen. So if you're like me, when I found out this was the parable we're doing and I read it, I was like, hot dog, there's a lot going on here. Okay, there's, there's some, some sequence, some changes, and you're like, what's the common thread here? And I think if we slow down, we walk through it, we'll see um, Jesus isn't speaking in code here. He's not just giving a, a lot of what to do. Rather, he's sharing how to do it. And more importantly, when we zoom out, we, we recognize Jesus himself modeled how to do these things. This is what Jesus said in, in verse 1 to his disciples. Things that cause people to stumble are bound to come. Guys, we know this. It's inevitable. It's impossible to avoid hard things in life. Offenses from other people, hang-ups, hinderings, all that. It's impossible. We know they're going to come. But woe, grief to anyone, shame be upon, hardship come to anyone through whom they come. Don't be somebody who causes others to be hung up in their faith journeys. Don't be someone who causes someone to stumble in their walk with the Lord. And he goes on to illustrate this, just how intense and, 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 and important this is. He says this in verse 2. It would be better for them to be thrown into a sea with a millstone tied around their neck than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. So watch yourselves. Now, uh, he's saying one of these little ones. The first thing I thought, oh, is, are there children around? Is Jesus referring to kids? More than likely not. We don't see that in the context. But rather, this is kind of like a nickname for believers that Jesus is is wanting to exercise childlike faith. So he's, he's calling them little ones. The other believers, other brothers and sisters in Christ, don't cause them to stumble. It's better to have a millstone tied around your neck. Now, the idea of a millstone. When I read this as a kid, I thought to myself, I pictured like a, a puka shell necklace with like a rock on it, you know? Okay, we all had one of those in the day, let's be honest, right? Okay, lame. Now, now they're like cool again, which, which I, don't, I don't get. It's kind of like side rant here socks, right? The low-cut socks were cool, then they weren't. Now the high socks are cool, now they're not. I'm, I just have chosen to go mid-calf and be like, I'm never going to be cool, so whatever. <laughs> Anyways, that's for free. So, millstone, okay? That's not what we're talking about, a little rock here, okay? This is what we're talking about. This is a millstone. It's a good, like, three feet in diameter, weighs anywhere from 1,100 to 2,000 pounds, so imagine that bad boy tied around your neck and being thrown into the sea. Basically, that's assured death, no doubt about it. And it's rather graphic when, when you start to picture that, like that is intense. And Jesus is saying it's better for that to happen to than to cause someone to be idle or, or hindered or stumble in their walk with me and pursuing me. And man, I, I read that, I'm like, we, we gotta take that to heart. So Jesus concludes with this imperative and he says, so watch yourselves. Watch yourselves. And ultimately, the first thing he's telling the disciples to do is this. He's telling them to live carefully. Be careful and have caution in how you live. It's important. And not just the outward, overt things that we do. I mean, those are pretty easy to see when we, we offend someone. We, we respond the wrong way, and we see how that has hindered them, affected them, hurt them, you name it. But, okay, what about the, the private things in our lives, the secret sins that we're harboring, that if they were to come to light, it would absolutely wreck our lives, hurt our children, hurt our friends, hurt our spouse, hurt our community group members, you name it. And Jesus is saying, you must live carefully. You must watch yourselves. Take this serious. We should ask ourselves, do I have a lifestyle that makes it confusing for someone to follow Jesus? When they look at my life, are they like, what, 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 what is following Jesus to you? Because I'm, I'm, I'm confused by that. 
Do I have an attitude that causes someone to question what it means to be a Christian? How I respond. I'm not someone like James says I should be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Rather, I'm slow, rather I'm, oh shoot, now I messed it up. <laughs> you get out of sync, you're like, we should be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. And instead we're being uh, slow to hear, quick to speak, quick to anger. We have a, a, a response in us that is not producing the righteousness of God. It's demonstrating the sinfulness of man. Am I hiding something in my life that would wreck my life or the lives of others around me if it came to light? This is why Jesus is saying we must live carefully. Watch yourselves and how you live. And he, he hits on this, and it's, it's uh, be careful that you don't cause other people to sin. But then he quickly goes into our responsibility when other people do sin against us or we observe it. And this is what he says in the next verse. If your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. Now, the if here is, it could really be translated not if, but when. It's, it's used to denote it's expected to happen. And we can relate with this. If our brother or sister sins against you, come on. We know for a fact at some point someone's going to offend us. They stepped in the coffee line in front of us, and you're like, oh, no, you didn't. Come on now. I was here first, right? Uh, whatever it may be, small, large, we're going to be offended or hurt by people. And it's saying, when your brother or sister sins against you, this is your response. You should rebuke them. You should rebuke them. Now, one of two people in the room, right? Maybe the first person is like, you're giving me permission to go to someone and tell them what's wrong in them? Let's go, right? This is, this is what I live for. I'm critical in my head all day long. Now you're giving me permission to go and do it? Let's, yeah, let's do it. If that's your heart posture, then that is an immediate disqualification from entering into someone's life and rebuking them. Now, maybe you're a little more like me and you're like, you know, I don't really like the confrontation. I don't like to call things out in people that aren't right, that isn't God-honoring. I don't love that. I don't find joy in that. I, I have that very, like, spiritual prayer of, Lord, just reveal to them their wrong ways, right? <laughs> don't use me, but somehow reveal it to them. But in that prayer, I'm not exercising a heart of faith or obedience to take the right next step. Think about it this way. God may be calling me to save that person from a millstone being tied around their neck and being thrown in the sea, the consequences of their sinful actions. God might be using me to do that. And it helps when I think we understand rebuke, because when I hear rebuke, I think, you know, hey, knock it off. It's just a sharp, it's intense. It's, now, I don't, I don't think it's quite that. I, I think it's what Jesus asked us to do is this, is to correct lovingly. That we'd come alongside someone Say, this, this is not right or God-honoring in your life. In fact, it's negatively impacting others around you. And, and I have this immense burden, this immense desire to help you not face the consequences of that or others around you. And you share that truth in a loving way. It's, it's this. It's burden for more than frustrated with. If you're entering in to rebuke someone or correct lovingly, there should be more of a heart of burden for them rather than frustration with them. This is easy, right? The frustration piece. When someone hurts us or someone hurts someone we love, we can easily become frustrated. But we ought to have, I think, prayers and postures that say, ultimately, I'm burdened for them. I recognize that hurting people will hurt people. And I have to see that hurt that is in that person and realize I don't want them to be on that trajectory of the millstone tied around their neck and thrown in the sea. So, God, I'm stepping out in faith to lovingly correct this individual. We shouldn't shy away from those opportunities. Do you know someone who's on a path to destruction? Do you know someone who's one step away from wrecking their lives or hurting those around them? Maybe they're just taking the initial steps and you're afraid to enter into that because, man, it's going to affect the relationship. Maybe they've been on that pathway for a long time and you're kind of like, you know what, what's, what's the point? They've been, they've been living that way forever. Why would I enter into that now? Perhaps God's calling you to lovingly correct someone around you who needs that. 
to be saved from the consequences that will be brought on them or others. Now, so far Jesus has said, live carefully and then, you know, correct lovingly. And this is the hypothetical scenario he's walking the disciples through. So this is what we see happen from that. It says it here in the text. If your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. And if they repent, now this is the if that is really when. This is, it's, it's expected to happen that they'll repent. It says then, give them the 100 question Scantron test to see if they're really repentant. No. Hook them up to the polygraph to see if they're really repentant. No, it says, forgive them. Forgive them. You've lovingly corrected them, rebuked them. They've, all we can assume is that they're truly repentant. It's expected that, that, that another believer would be repentant about these, these actions that were offending others and hurting others. And here's what we do. We forgive them. Now, that's our message for today. It works that easy, right? No. If you've ever entered into conflict or, or relational discord, we know that this is not an assured path. This is a prescribed path, though. Jesus is saying what's true of two believers, an offense happens, and we should lovingly correct that and call that out. And we should have hearts of repentance saying, I, I'm sorry, brother, I'm sorry, sister, that my my actions were doing that. Can I have your forgiveness? And then, yes, of course, we forgive them. But Jesus knows that there's layers to this. And he adds another layer here for the disciples to think about. He says this. He goes, guys, even if they sin against you seven times in a day and seven times come back to you saying, I repent, you must forgive them. Hang on now, Jesus. You're telling me, Someone sins against me seven times in one day, comes to me seven times saying, oh, I'm sorry, brother. Okay, Jesus, yeah. Uh, and I got to forgive them? Are you kidding me? And the first thing I think when I read this is seven times in one day. Hot dog. That's, that's, uh, that's a bad relationship. But I give you permission to call up Eric and Jane Hancock right now, my parents. Beep, 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 beep. Mr. Hancock, um, raising Corey. Now, um, <laughs> I've got a lot of questions, but just one. Uh, did he ever sin against you seven times in one day? And my mom would respond, Eric, answer, answer, answer what Corey needs, needs to hear. Of course, he's never, he's never done that, right? He, although he is our redheaded, uh, you know, middle child, he was a joy to parent and never offended us seven times in one day. No, they would never say that, right? That, of course, as a child, I've sinned against them seven times in one day. I think of my relationship with my spouse, right? JC, uh, if you called her up, right, she'd probably give the classic, like, I'll neither confirm nor deny the accuracy of, <laughs> of those. No, the answer would be, without a doubt, yes. And seven times I've had to go to her in a day or in a week and say, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? And then when I zoom out and I think about my relationship with the Lord, how often do I sin against him seven, eight, nine, ten times in a day? And just to paint the picture, to bring us to reality here that this isn't that far-fetched, let's play out a hypothetical Monday morning. We're going to be late to work. We hit some traffic. So we text our coworkers and boss, hey, I'm going to be late to the meeting. Sorry about that. Uh, but boom, we've sinned against our coworkers because that was actually kind of a lie. We are in traffic, but we're not in traffic because of traffic. We're in traffic because we left our house late, because we went to bed late, because we we're on our phones late. So, boom, little white lie, kind of, eh, well, I'm in traffic, right? We've all done that before. Let's be honest. Okay, then you get into the meeting, and then, um, you know, everyone's like, hey, did everyone read the two-page report? And you're like, yes, I did read that two-page report. Uh, where, what, what email was that again? You know, you're flipping through, and, and you, you kind of just lie to your coworkers again because you're up late on your phone, right? You didn't do what you're supposed to do. Then in that meeting, you look for an opportunity to, to put someone down. They kind of say something silly, and you put them down because it will elevate yourself, and, and you kind of have some pride in that. Well, you've just sinned against your coworkers three times now. And then as you leave that meeting, you're in the hallway, and you know, you kind of say to the person you're walking with, man, that knucklehead leading that meeting, I could have done a better job than that, right? Boom, four times now, and it's not even noon, we've sinned against our coworkers. So you're tracking with me now? It, it's, it's believable. 
And Jesus is saying that, that our response to people who continually offend us is this, you must forgive them. You must forgive them. He's ultimately saying this and what to do, forgive faithfully. Forgive faithfully. Can you bring up the third point there? Forgive faithfully. Now, I do want to preface that this is one message in which there's a facet of we're talking about forgiveness. There's no possible way I could unpack all the layers and all the scenarios in which forgiveness uh, is needed. Um, we would need four, five, six weeks, uh, weekend messages to do that. So I, I don't want to speak in such a way that oversimplifies this, but rather, no matter your situation of forgiveness, maybe helps you find a baby step in the direction towards seeking forgiveness or granting that. So I, I, don't, I don't want you to walk away thinking, th this is a context in which it's believer and a believer. One sins, you correct it, they're repentant, we forgive each other, period, end of discussion. That's pretty clean and neat. I understand not every situation is like that. When there's been years of abuse, years of hurt, and maybe you've never heard once, uh, and I'm sorry, will you forgive me? Uh, so I, there's no way I can touch on all that today, but to Lord willing, simply provide a baby step in that direction by what we see here in the text. So Jesus has said what to do. We're going to shift a little bit and, and see how he's telling the disciples to do it. The disciples are like us. When we heard the seven times in one day, we're like, Jesus, are you kidding me? I don't know about that. Their, their response is, increase our faith. Increase our faith. I, I find it hard to believe, Jesus, that that would be the, the needed response to someone who's continually hurting us. I find it hard to believe that. Will you help us trust you. Notice they don't ask for more understanding. They don't ask for more discernment of like, well, Jesus, can you give us more discernment to see if they're really repentant? No, Lord, help us believe that your way is the best way. Lord, help us believe that you're in control of the situation. And we see ultimately what, what they, they hit on is what Jesus is going to run with. And how you do it, it's a matter of faith. Forgiveness is a faith venture. Forgiveness is a faith venture. It's not something that we just say, okay, I'm going to forgive, and we take that step of obedience. It's not always that easy. It's a moment where we have to trust that God is sovereign, God's in control, I'm a broken person, this other person's broken, and, and, and I'm supposed to forgive as I've been forgiven. Lord, that's hard, but I trust you, and I trust that your way is right. It's a faith venture. And, and Jesus is going to run with that. He's going to illustrate that for them. This is what Jesus says to his disciples. He replied, If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, Be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. And when I first read this, I'm like, What a random example. Like, Jesus, where, where are you going with this? But more than likely, they're sitting under the shade of a mulberry tree. And Jesus, he, he, he's all about like the the tree illustrations, the, the seed and farmer illustrations. And so he, he's using objects that they can identify. So here's this big tree that we're under. And here's this tiny seed in my hands. If you had just this much faith, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea. Who? Think about the impossibility of this. Have any of you had to remove a stump before? Yeah, many in my day. My dad just cut down trees for fun and was like, boys, go remove this stump, you know? <laughs> Jane, we're raising them to be men, not boys. So we'd go out there and, uh, you know, stumps there, get the shovel, you know, break the shovel because dad, you gave us these old janky shovels. Come on, like get us something real to work with here. But, but you, you put that in the ground, shunk, and, and you lever that up, and then you throw the first load of dirt and you've got a thousand more of those to do, right? You go around and around, and then you're barely seeing roots. Okay, a thousand more shovels full, right? And then you get to the roots, and you got to grab the splitting maul to, to break those roots, and you're swinging that thing. You like that form? That's a man who split some wood in his time, okay? <laughs> Believe it or not, these pastor hands have worked before, okay? 
And uh, you break those roots, and then you get out the big, you know, uh, lever bar. I've heard it's called a Texas toothpick, okay? But the thing that weighs like 30 pounds, and, and you, you get the stump up, and you get a strap under it so you can pull it out with a tractor or with a truck or whatever. And before you know it, there's your weekend. I successfully removed a stump. And, and here Jesus is talking in, in first century context when they didn't have any of those tools, so the, the disciples were even more minds blown. I mean, you're telling me, speaking to a tree with a just a small amount of faith, that that, that that could take me as far as uprooting a tree by commanding it. Man, I, I'm all about that. I would have myself a tree, you know, stump removal business if, if I could do that. Impossible, right? And then look what happens off of that. A second impossible thing, that it would be planted in the sea. So I, I've never successfully removed a stump or tree and kept it living, okay, never. But I'm, I'm no arborist or, or botanist. Is that what a plant person is, botanist? Yeah, I get into head knots, all right. I know some big words, okay. Um, <laughs> I'm no botanist, but I, I don't think the sea is a fertile ground for a recently uprooted tree, right? Um, I, I don't know much. I, my wife is an indoor plant person. She propagates plants. Our house is just plants for days. It's like a jungle, okay? Um, and, and I am not blessed with that gift. I have what we call the black thumb, okay? I kill things. I kill things with plants, not people. I kill things, <laughs> you know, part pastor, part assassin, you know, <laughs> living that lifestyle. But I don't know much about how it works, but that's, that's impossible, you can't uproot a tree and plant it in the sea. And, and what Jesus, he's using this, this illustration of this small little amount of faith can make the impossible possible. That's what faith can do. It makes the impossible possible. And when I think about this, I think of salvation. Think of the, the very way that we can have new life. We, 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 remove, we move from being dead in our sins to being made alive in Christ. We move from being an enemy of God to now a friend of God. That only happens by grace through faith. Faith makes that possible. I think of the instances in my life or others around me that I know where, where um, my heart was just rooted, to use the illustration here, with, with bitterness and hurt. And I'm just like, there's no way God can remove this. And there's no way he's going to place it over there and change things and make it right and that I'm going to be okay with this person again. But through a step of faith and trusting God, he made the impossible possible. And that's what Jesus is getting at here. And it's not just, you see, faith in uh, general, but it's, it's faith in the right person. See this first point here. It's faith in the right person. That it's not the the size of your faith, because guys, here's this small mustard seed. It's not the size of your faith, it's the person of your faith. It's not this grand amount of faith, it's the object, it's the person of your faith. And it makes me think of the instances I see in the Old Testament where something amazing happens, right? Like the Israelites crossing the Red Sea. Is that really a great amount of faith, uh, to, to take a step onto dry land as God parted the entire sea? No, that, that's, a, that's a small step of faith, but that's a great demonstration of a great, powerful God. And I, I think of David and Goliath, a giant being taken down. I, I think David took a small step of obedience, a small step of faith to see a great God do something incredible. So it's not as much great faith in God as it is faith in a great God. That's what we see all throughout Scripture over and over again. It's not the size of our faith, it's the person of our faith. I think of the, the lines in the Bible of, you know, we are more than conquerors, finish the rest of it, through Christ. I can do all things, finish the rest of it, through Christ. Right? It's, it's not faith in us, in our ability. It's faith in the right person, God, who can do the impossible make it possible. And he's going to drive the exclamation point home on this teaching as he walks through this parable with the disciples. This is what he says in verse 7. Suppose one of you has a servant plowing or looking after the sheep. Will he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, hey, come along now. Sit down and eat. I made some Annie's mac and cheese. Come on, enjoy it, right? 
Now, the disciples are like, good one, Jesus. None of us are ever going to have a servant, okay? We're, we're fishermen. We, we follow you. We have this nomadic life. There's no way that's true. Jesus, okay, all right, just go with me here. Suppose someone, it doesn't have to be you, is he going to say to his servant when they come in, hey, I, I made you dinner? The disciples' implied answer is like, no, no, that, that's not what the servant does. That wouldn't be the response of the master. He said, like, okay, keep going with me here for a second. Won't he rather say, prepare my supper and get yourself ready and wait on me while I eat and drink? And after that, you may eat and drink? And they said, of course. I mean, that's the servant's job. That's what they would do. And then will, will he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? The disciples probably thought, I mean, I, I don't think so. He's just doing his job. And when you read this, at least when I read this initially, I'm like, that's kind of harsh. Like, yeah, what a poor servant. But that's a, that's a first century context in which they would understand that and, and answer in that way, no, yes, no. I want to think of a 21st century example, and I'll rewind in time a little bit to one of my first jobs at the end of high school uh, was working at Menards, okay? It's like a Lowe's or Home Depot in the Midwest. Save big money at Menards. That's a slogan, okay? Got a little jingle to it. I won't sing it for you, but uh, I, I had the honor and privilege to start off as a cart pusher, okay? That's what I was. They called me a carry-out because that was more dignified, you know? But in reality, I pushed carts, okay? And pushing carts is uh, it's a tricky business, okay? Because here's, here's the job, right? Carts go out into the parking lot, and then you have to bring them in from the parking lot. There's a lot to it, okay? I know it sounds simple on the surface, but you've got lumber carts, you've got drywall carts, you've got landscaping carts, you've got the regular shopping carts, you've got the motorized assisted, you know, uh, carts. It, it's a lot to handle. But in, in me showing my amazing ability to bring carts in from the outside, they, they trained me on being a cashier and doing front end returns and, and customer service, all that. And so I was kind of a multi-purpose person and that, that was my job. So. Uh, I can tell you, never once, when I was called in on my radio, I was big stuff, I had my own radio, I'm like, yeah, what you need, boss? And um, he would tell me, hey, Corey, we need you to come in, lines are backed up, uh, you know, can you cashier for us for five, ten minutes? Sure, come in. And never once did my manager say to me, you know what, Corey, why don't you head up to the break room, you, you got some snacks up there, here's a dollar for a pop, okay? Um, that's what we call it in the Midwest, pop, what do you guys call it here? Soda. So what are we in the 50s? Soda? <laughs> Come on. He never said that to me. And instead, I would go to, to the register and I'm boop, boop, get the, get the lady. Lady, we all know the lady. I won't mention her name. Can I get a price check on that? Right? <laughs> yep. And, and, and you're just like, okay, patience, Lord. But anyways, we get them through. We get the lines down, all that, good, everything. And never once when I did that did they go over the loudspeaker Attention, Menards customers, can we, can we have your attention, please? We'd just like to uh, uh, shine awareness and, and the light of glory on our star employee, Corey Hancock, for what he's done for this place and coming in to, to, to help the lines get down. No, never once, right? This is just a, a modern-day illustration of what, what Jesus is saying in this text. It, it's Never in our minds would we fathom that. It's, it's not needed. You're just simply doing your job. And then Jesus drives home this point here in verse 10. This is what he's saying ultimately with this last, this last line. So you also, disciples, newsflash, you're the servant. You kind of laughed and chuckled at being the master. We know that's not the case. You're the servant. But this should be your response when you've done everything that you were told to do. This should be your response. We are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. We are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. And what this is revealing is that we are to do it with faith, forgive with faith. We're supposed to correct lovingly others with faith. We're supposed to live carefully with faith. But we don't just have it in the right person, but next we'll see here that we do it with the right perspective. We have the right alignment, values, and priorities of who we are and who God is and how we should live. So let's, let's see what Jesus is saying in that verse. Let's unpack that for a second. We're unworthy servants. Notice he doesn't say 
we're worthless. He says you're unworthy. God is a redemptive God. He doesn't need us, but he chooses to use us. He's a gracious God. We're imperfect, but he allows us to serve him. We're not worthless, but rather we're simply unworthy. And we're to do uh, only what we've been called to do. I, I, when, I, when I study this text, this phrase for me has been just um, incredibly impactful. That this is my life mission. Recognize I'm an unworthy servant. My, I'm only here to do what God has called me to do. When he's called me to forgive others, he's not calling me to do something that he hasn't done for me. I'm only giving away what I've already received in that grace and that mercy. And I don't exactly know. I know that it says, I think it's in the Sermon on the Mount where it's, it's saying the, the Lord says, well done, good and faithful servant. Or in other instances, he says, depart from me. You know, When we stand before Jesus, Lord willing, that's the response we get from him is well done, good and faithful servant. And I don't know if I'll have an opportunity to respond. I don't know exactly what that will be. I know we'll be, you know, bowing down, worshiping Jesus. But I hope my reply, if I get a chance to, you know me, I like to talk. Jesus, come on, Jesus, let's talk a little. I hope my reply is somewhere along these lines. Well done, good and faithful servant. Jesus, I was an unworthy servant, but you still chose to use me. And all I did was, was only because I was supposed to do it, and you called me to do it, and you were worth it. And um, I appreciate you always being patient with me, kind with me, despite my failures. That that, that would be my response before, when I stand before Jesus one day. I'm an unworthy servant. And how I've summarized this text for me and to walk away with a practical next step is, is this statement that I'm speaking to myself, and it's this. Who I am, in light of who God is, must impact how I live. Who I am. I'm an unworthy servant. In light of who God is, he is a worthy king. He is a worthy master. And therefore, that impacts how I live. I live carefully. I correct lovingly, and I faithfully forgive that that would be true of us as believers, as Christ followers, who aren't confusing others with what it means to be a Christian because we're simply giving away what we have already received. We're simply demonstrating to others what has already been demonstrated to us. By this, we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. So what about you? What seems impossible in your life right now? That a small step of faith, a small step of obedience is going to do, do the impossible. It's going to make the impossible possible. Maybe it's salvation. Maybe it's, it's, I've never once even fathomed that someone could forgive me for all that I've done in life. Maybe it's, maybe it's relational forgiveness. I've never thought that, that my heart could move from a place of bitterness and hurt to, man, I'm in right relationship with someone. Maybe it's the coming alongside and lovingly correcting someone who, who needs truth in their life because they're one step away from sheer destruction and consequences of their sin. Would you take that step of faith today? Would you see God put you on a trajectory of, of blessing, of of saving others from the consequences or saving yourself from the consequences that come from neglecting his truth, neglecting his word. I'd love to pray for us today in conclusion. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you are a patient and kind God. I thank you that you haven't just told us what to do. You've told us how to do it. And God, you have demonstrated love towards us that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. You have shown us how to love. You have shown us how to live. Father, I am well aware of the fact that nothing I have done, nothing I will do will make me worthy of being a servant of you. You can only do that in your redemptive nature. Father, I pray that today we would surrender as faithful servants to you, 
to be taking steps of obedience that really are steps of faith because we just want to honor and glorify you and point others to you. Help us to be faithful disciples, faithful servants who don't lead our lives by the emotions we feel or what, or what we, we think is the right thing to do, but Lord, the response to you and what you've done for us, we just want to reciprocate to others. That this church would be impacted by one another love that it's, it's, it's unfathomable because we're loving others how we have first been loved. And I pray that would be true, that that would radically change our families, our home lives, that would radically change our workplaces and environments, that would radically change our community groups and how we do life together, Father, that your love is present in that way. That's our prayer, that's our plea. We pray for your help in that, and we ask these things in your son's name. Amen.